Yeah, 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 that would be good. Welcome, Mr. Patrick Brown, to How Art Works. This is our second time attempting this. We, we had a uh, few audio issues last time, so apologies for that, anyone who tried to listen in. But this is How Art Works. My name is DA Carter, aka Papa Fire, when I put out music and creative things. And that's probably the channel that you're on right now. This is a show called How Art Works, uh, which is basically where I talk to creators of all stripes making things and ask them how it works in their life. You know, is it a job? Is it a passion? Is it something that pays the bills or is it a uh, hobby that co does nothing but cost money but is, you know, incredibly fulfilling? For the record, I thought all of the above. <laughs> when you said those things, I feel like that's a good thing. Yeah, that, that what, it is a job? That it's or? a passion, it's a job, it's a hobby. And what was the last? Um, whether it does nothing but cost money. <laughs> oh, right, yeah, whether it pays the bills or it does nothing but cost money. Actually, it pays the bills. Yeah, good. At least in my case, yeah. yeah. So, just by way of introduction, uh, you've created a thing which was called Code Pact and is now called Tree Scribe. That's right, yep. And this thing that you've made, this is a software engineering project. Do you want to kind of just describe it for okay. people who might not be familiar? I'll do my best to describe it without making people bored. And it's completely forgivable, by the way, if you find yourself feeling bored as I describe this, because it's a hell of a lot more interesting to see and use than it is to listen to a description of. Yep. Um, <laughs> it is basically a way to create documents really, really quickly um, and to customize them at a very high level to suit your circumstances. And it's, it's I'm talking about legal documents in okay. this case. Yeah. So, hmm, some our, kind of animal dog, fight happening out there. Awesome. Yeah, our dog's getting very cranky. Sorry. No, 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 not a, not at all. Actually, it adds to the the uh, the ambiance. The ambiance. All right. So, um, I think where was I before the animal attack? Uh, you were talking about tree scribe. Yeah, I was just trying to remember exactly where I left off. Well, look, I suppose to just continue on the general vibe of what I was saying it's a way to create legal documents because we feel like actually one of the great drivers of wealth inequality right now is the fact that um, only people with money have access to legal tools and legal tools are really powerful they're a great way to assert your interests that that's why rich people use them and so um, we like the idea of distributing that much in the same way that telephone or mobile phones have distributed lots of creative capacity to people um, and you know the internet has distributed a lot of the ability to publish like what we're doing now for instance yeah absolutely and Very I similar. must forgive about the publication I'm on my phone right now but uh, I'm just tweeting things out so my apologies tweeting things out no worries man but you know what I've got to say what's interesting and this is in no way a criticism but what's interesting is like it's harder for me to keep my thread of thought while I'm distracted if you're distracted yeah and that's just an interesting thing. I mean, you've got to tweet it and like, it's great that you're tweeting it, but like, it's really fascinating to me actually how hard it is to stay focused if you're not. Yeah. Well, now I am. I'm locked in. No, it's, it's not a criticism though. Like, I'm just fascinated by that. No, I've never free. noticed that before, actually. Sure. I can, I can, I, I think that there's a very obvious explanation, which is when we are conversing or when we're really doing anything, Yeah. you, we have mirror neurons, right? So... If you are just speaking and the person that you're speaking to is not engaged, yeah. then by necessity, you would disengage because your mirror neurons are like, well, what's more interesting than what I'm saying right now? I suppose. Yeah. So it works both ways. As in, if you're a performer, um, part of the reason that people want to watch you perform yeah. is because if they're sitting there and you're doing some cool, awesome thing, in a way, the audience is embodied, is partially embodying that because they're with you mm. and they're locked into you mm. and they think, oh, sick. Part of what makes watching, you know, say Guns N' Roses so awesome is that you get to be like, oh man, imagine how cool that would be being Slash right now, being able to rip all those I sweet see. riffs. Yeah. But it works in the opposite way. As a performer, I find, if you have a disengaged audience, hmm. 
it definitely, definitely affects the quality of your performance uh, because subconsciously you doubt everything. You know, like these people are disengaged because I suck, because I'm boring, um, and you feel all that self-doubt. And because people are distracted, you think it doesn't matter. What you're doing doesn't matter because they're all focused on other things. Yeah. And so you subconsciously or consciously start to focus on those potential other things that are more interesting that they're engaged in as well. So that's my theory. Hmm. So many apologies for not being focused. Zero apologies required. <laughs> and so the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about with this thing uh, called tree scribe that you've made is that you took a path. We went to law school together. Yeah, we did. Yep. We did. And we worked together at a law firm together before we both went our different ways. That's right. And one thing that I'm really curious about is people that are on creative paths that have taken unusual journeys. And I think yeah. it would be a quite a reasonably unusual journey to go from being a, a corporate lawyer to a software engineer. I mean, you still do law. And I do, yes. So do, so do I yep. in my own way. Yep. But um, I think it's unusual that you go from, I think the law is a particularly uncreative type of environment for the most part. You can find creative new ways to do things, for example. Yeah, see, I would just, I would quibble with that in one way. I think that it's actually a very creative pursuit, but the business model forces a lot of creativity out of it. Okay. At least in its implementation in corporate law firms. Sure. Which actually could be a hell of a lot more creative than they are. Well, um, and that's kind of one of my little hobby horses. So I suppose you've trespassed on that territory that I've got like real strong opinions about, which is what this is for, right? Yeah, so sure. Absolutely. It's, I, I mean, in, in, I'm just talking in, in the creative sense. And I think about when people talk about law more, or more, the way I engage with it, yep. it seems to be a regressive type of law in, in terms of what I do, which is more on the personal injury and some criminal so and civil it's stuff. It's interesting though, because you're doing a lot of litigation work, yes. right? Which is past focused. Exactly. And I think that's really actually one of the better ways to describe the distinction between transactional law and litigious law. With transactional law, you are future focused. Well, and that's and that's why I say our perspectives are different. Because yeah. I, because I'm in a courtroom and people are arguing Reflecting about on the past. a set of circumstances and trying to put things yes. back the way they and were. And to the extent they're not. like actually in a courtroom, things did not go well. Almost by definition, yes. something bad has happened. So something bad has happened yes. and you're examining that past activity and yeah. you're saying, what can be done about this? Uh, how can we put people back in the same situation with money? Now that fundamentally you know, is, is, a, is, a not, is an uncreative activity yes. in, in, a, in, a very, in a very significant way, which is why that's my attitude and opinion towards law. But what you do in terms of companies want to do a thing and they want to check if it's legal. And how do we work together? There's yeah, a lot they, more of that. Exactly. And yeah. so so maybe it was glib of me to say, or not glib, but... Oh, no. it's. I mean, it makes perfect sense in the area that you're in, for sure. sure. Yeah. But my association with the law is... And, and I guess most people don't think that, you know, law is a creative endeavor. Hmm. Um, so you have a different view, which is great. But still, it's, it's interesting going from uh, something that you did study exhaustively for mm. you know however many years you went mm. to law school i was in i was studying law for five years doing a double degree you were similar i was the same yes yeah and Arts so and law yep and so yeah we obviously you've gone from from that kind of training rigorous training in one area to being self-taught in software engineering and i just want to hear you talk a little bit about that what's it like to discover a passion for something and then teach it to yourself right um I, I think just to sort of inoculate myself against feeling self-conscious about repeating bits and pieces that I said before, for the record, I've said a bit of this before, but... <laughs> to, uh, which, you, which you will never hear if you're listening to yeah, this Yeah, and no one will ever hear it. I just feel some kind of um, I impulse to uh, put that there on the record. You're not going to bore me. That's No, okay. okay so um, I was working in a law firm, one of the big ones in the city, and I actually was okay with the work. The, the work itself, in fact, I found real interesting. Um, what I didn't really like was the inability to take initiative to improve things. Because I really am a believer that it doesn't really matter what you're doing as a job with, you know, just in very general terms, provided you have the 
ability to take an initiative about how you're going to do that thing. Someone gives you an outcome they want you to get to. And if you have the freedom to pursue that outcome in the way that you want to, I think that provided you have that freedom, most jobs or work can be fulfilling. Or to the extent that you have that freedom and it can be executed. So for example, that's right. Exactly. Yes. If someone says, Hey, there's no point I'm, in having theoretical ideas. You have to be yeah. able to implement it. <laughs> so if someone says, Hey, I've got all these dirty dishes and I, I want you to come up with creative ways to get them clean. And yeah. like, all you have is hot water. Um, then well, it's like, yeah. yeah you so know, actually, you know, it's funny you mentioned more, that you're given more agency, but my first job ever yeah. was a dishwasher. In a okay. restaurant when did I was 15 you, years you, old at the Starfish Deli in Batemans Bay. And you innovated? Did you? Dude, innovate? I totally innovated. <laughs> I'm not joking either. Like this for me, I mean, there were these giant loads of plates coming in and I kind of got a certain rhythm and understanding about when the rushes would come and how to coordinate those rushes and where to put stuff in the limited space available to me to make sure that I handled it. So, I mean, to be absolutely frank with you, I didn't mind the job. Sure. Because there was totally some thinking you could do about how to do it better. I mean, it could be a wiring thing. Maybe I'm wired in that direction. But whatever. I mean, I, I do think that for me, that's really where the juice is. The ability to just get whatever you're doing and figure out a better way to do it. That's, um, in, that's inspiring, man. Plausibly. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying that as a way to sort of big myself up. But that was honestly how I approached the job. And I got paid, I think it was like $5.30 an hour at whoa. the time. Like, because I was 14, 15 years old. What and so was it was low wage. something? Yeah, sort of. Whoa. Would have been 1996, perhaps. Um, but whatever. I mean, I was fine with it. It was my first job. I was stoked to have it. Yeah. And the restaurateur, I think, originally gave me the job because he happened to know my dad because they're both in the same town. But actually, by the end of it, I felt like this dude, knowing what he knew when I was leaving the job, about how I could work, would have hired me on my own merits. Yeah. Um, and I suppose I found that real satisfying. You earned your stripes as a... I feel like basically he respected my work as a dishwasher. Well, yeah, that's... <laughs> At the end of the job. That's a, that's a strong place to be. You want to be... about it, man. Yeah. Even as a 15-year-old, you know. Well, the ability to earn respect and to, and to feel like you've um, have got some kind of mastery, for yeah. sure. It, do, it, wouldn't, it doesn't matter what you're doing, particularly if you're just learning what that's like. Okay, so now fast forward that to... Was really though, that was the first time that I encountered people at work. Yeah. And realised, like, because adults always went to this place that was work. And I suppose up until that point, I had never been amongst them at their work. And it was kind of weird. I remember distinctly encountering 21, 22-year-old chefs and seeing these dudes at work doing their thing and like just kind of, I suppose, getting firsthand familiarity with what it looks like to do shit for other people and for that to be an intense, absorbing, um, I mean, I, I suppose I've always harbored an affinity for cooks and chefs since that job because they, they work so fucking hard. Yeah, that is a tough job. They work hard. Yeah. I actually don't know if I've come across a job that's more intense than that actually. Even since then. So I worked for a guy um, after I left the firm that we both worked at. Mm. I worked for a guy called Pete Sheehan, um, who is like a professional speaker guy. Mm -hmm. And I was doing sort of professional speaking work. And he was the kind of guy that wrote books and had ideas about work mm. and particularly preparing kids to leave work. Mm. And one of the things that he said stuck with me, which is that uh, work is your soul made manifest something like that okay. basically the idea that you spend an enormous chunk of your waking life earning money for people mm. or you know earning money for yourself and if you have the privilege to pursue like a passion and make that your job mm. then that's a really powerful thing to do and i agree with that it's not the be all and end all i think you can have a very fulfilling life even not oh, absolutely. doing the work that I mean, you do. I mean, it's that old distinction of like work to live or live to work. Yeah. And both are totally reasonable ways to pursue life. I for sure. I mean, I, and I think that's the, probably the contrast between us in terms of our creative endeavors. Like mm. your software engineering is actually quite tied into your work. They're whereas, one and the same thing. Yeah. yeah whereas mm. the stuff that I love to do, which is write songs and perform music, mm. is as diametrically opposed to 
you know, like I can't, uh, you know, bringing a guitar to work and playing yeah. in it's, a courtroom or something like that is unthinkable. In, in terms of like what the economy happens to be doing at the time, a few hundred years ago, your um, side project would have looked a hell of a lot more like a job and your job probably a bit more like a side project. Well, I, who knows? I mean, it's it's interesting how... Put it this way, I think it would have been easier to be a travelling entertainer than a lawyer well, a few in hundred me, years in, ago. In med- medieval times. Yeah. Like, no, sure. I mean that. Like, I do think these things are just dependent on the circumstances and it's kind of luck of the draw. Does the thing that you happen to like doing happen to pay you money in the current arrangement? In a particular climate, yeah, yeah. and culture. A historical moment, That that's, that's all very interesting. And I think that being a travelling troubadour would would suit me I would like that that would be fine I think it would suit you too but also I'm really glad to be born in the 21st century where we have it's you know, nice to have dentists definitely that is exactly what I wanted to that that was the thing <laughs> it was yeah. dentist, dentistry was every time I go to the dentist I have an overwhelming feeling of gratitude <laughs> that I live in the 21st century yeah there's no Just, doubt and honestly tomorrow I'm going to go in and get a thing chopped off me um, like a kind of a, a mole that looks a bit wonky and I'm going to go in there, I'm going to lie down on that table, and I'm going to be stoked that I don't live in the 17th century. There's no doubt about that. Um, and so, on this journey that we're both on following your creations, we've, got, we've gotten a little bit, you know, this is the nature of the beast. We get but sidetracked. We've gotten a little bit you sidetracked. You and I always get sidetracked. That's, that's fine. That's and sidetracked from sidetracks, by the way. <laughs> but that's actually one of the reasons it's always been fun talking to you. Um, but so, that's one of the... So, we're, you, you're... Working as a lawyer, yeah, and you. Yes, I was working you, at this you, firm. You t- you take a path that leads you down, learning something that's absolutely not. Do you know what, man? I'm going to take a step back. I'm yeah, going yeah. Take yeah. a step back, and say that it was an accident that I even ended up in a law firm. Okay. In the first place, so I I was actually really keen on the idea of being a journalist. Oh, really? Yes. I and didn't know this about you. You didn't know that. Right, so what I thought was I'm going to go travel someplace and kind of indulge this interest. And that's why I ended up in the Middle East, right? So I lived there for a year and a half and that was a really fascinating thing and probably not that relevant to this podcast. But like what it did was it kind of convinced me that I didn't want to be a journalist, actually. That living in places with civil strife and the like is just not fun. It's actually just... um, intensely consequential boredom worrying about security and all of that kind of thing so when I went back to law school because I'd suspended my studies to go on that little soiree um, I was like shit okay I'm not going to be a journalist so what I'm going to do now and then everyone around me was applying for, for clerkships sure. so I applied for a clerkship and ended up in the law firm and that probably bears that had a bit of influence in the sense that I was never really on the track to begin with it was a a place that I landed in terms of where I, there was an opportunity at a time when I was like, I'm not sure what to do. And then I kind of went with the flow at a loss of other things to do and ended up in the law firm. And like I said, was totally fine working there, got a lot out of it, enjoyed a lot of the people and the work, um, definitely didn't like being told what to do and didn't like the ability and, and just a lot of bullshit politics in those places. That's well known. I mean, not speaking out of school. Yeah, of course. Um, and, you know, not that I was sort of affected by it, but it actually just poisoned the environment. You know, so to the extent that there's a conflict between some senior people, that causes trouble for everyone beneath them. You know, it just makes things unpleasant for no reason, really. Yeah. Anyway, um, so you and I and two of our friends, actually one of whom was my brother, we all sort of concocted this idea that we were interested in pursuing. What was your idea? Let's be, f- let's be clear about that. Okay, yeah. So this is, this is just for people who don't know the context. This is a, uh, an idea that you had <coughs> that became a product that we, that we built or, or that one bloke who... That Tristan built. Yeah. Because Tristan, Tristan was the only guy who had any technical expertise whatsoever. Exactly. And he was a total trooper and, you know, learned on the job and was really good at it. Again, kind of boring to go into it, but it was an ill-fated adventure. It didn't work out. But the actual, the actual thing that we built, I don't think it was boring. I think it was quite cool. Oh, no. I don't think it was boring either. It's just that when it came to making money out of it, no, none true. of us wanted to do it. Well, the idea being that we'd set ourselves a timeline. And this is one thing that I learned from this process of working with you is that you had this great idea that was, if anything, slightly ahead of its time and we were a tiny fish 
in a giant, sh- you know, shark. That was part of it, sure. Yeah. Piranha pool. And that we were on a race, you know, against what are now, you know, massive movers and shakers that are doing stuff that was similar to this product. Yeah, it's very made. much. I mean, there are things <coughs> now that are very similar to what we were messing around with. Yeah. But the long and short of it was there was a commercial thing that we needed to do and none of us wanted to do it. Mm. And like in the end, we just kind of all went, nah, we're not that interested. Now, I had left my law firm job to pursue that thing um, to – you know, I wasn't worried about that because I just made sure that I got enough time at the law firm that I could open my own practice if I wanted to in the future. And so thereafter, I actually took time off and I just taught myself how to code because I'd enjoyed working on that project so much that I was like, okay, that was the most satisfying thing. Like building a product was the most satisfying thing that I've done to date since like playing with Play-Doh as a kid. It was kind of like that. There was like this giant interlude between being a kid who made stuff at preschool and maybe in the earlier years of school. And then it felt like this sort of long, dry period of learning how to be a critic, how to write essays, how to regurgitate facts. And then this kind of re-emergence into the world of making shit, which I don't think the educational system is well geared towards encouraging. Because creativity does not fit well into a goddamn schedule, which is what they need to run a scalable system like the public education system we've got. It's and I sympathise with that conundrum that they're facing, <coughs> but um, I think they should be a, a little more explicit about the fact that that's the problem. Yes, that's right. Even just an acknowledgement. An acknowledgement um, would be helpful. Yeah, because... Then what, lets you help sort of work around it. You know, because schools are still based on the sort of industrial factory... Um, yeah. factory floor model yeah. of um, producing, but it's just kind of like a little academic assembly line. That's right. The idea being that you're producing, um, instead of producing a, a motor vehicle, you're actually producing a, a young person yeah. who knows how to write, read and... Yeah, and they, they kind of like, all the creativity is elsewhere in some sense in the industrial process. What the industrial process is about is implementing someone's creativity that's been had. And exactly. you actually don't need to be creative. You just need to follow the bloody rules. Well, and there's a time yeah. and a place for that. And I'm not against that aspect of education, but they do leave out the creativity. And so I felt like this thing had been reawakened. I well, suppose that's the point. In the, in the, in the sense that um, creativity exists in schools, yeah. however, it's just clearly not valued. So as oh, someone, look, I wouldn't go that far. No, no, no. I, I let me just, just maybe systemically. Hit, just, hit, yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Okay, yeah. Uh, I mean systemically in terms of ranks and marks and that kind of I thing. I completely and agree with that. Okay, as someone sorry. who, yeah. you know, I went to a selective school, and so yeah, the importance of the raw, you know, the mark that you got, sure, was huge. Yes, and there was a lot of discussion, and we would pour over like the stats, totally, about which courses had the best outcomes in terms of you know what they converted into your raw mark yeah the old and adage is is what you can quantify you pay attention to and if you did arts drama architecture mm. if you did basically any any of the creative things mm. they scaled terribly mm. so you could do really well and it still would contribute to a an average mark and i i was super competitive guy mm. in high school mm. and i was far more academically gifted than I was physically, let's just say that. Okay. And so we couldn't really shake it up on the rugby field. And so my, you know... The outlet of, was academics, yeah. Yeah. And so I, I, despite the fact that I wasn't good at maths or science, I just did all the subjects that I was good at to the max. So mm. even though I was interested in art and I was interested in drama, I didn't choose them because I knew that I couldn't get a really good mark. And for some reason that was super important to me. Yeah. And had my priorities been slightly different, you know, I would have... Well, at that stage, your priorities are heavily impacted by the environment you're brought up in. Correct. And so, I mean, the fact that you'd been sent to a selective school in some sense selects for a preoccupation with the numbers. Or even, you know, the fact that my folks suggested that I should try. And then I'd already been, I'd already gone to a selective primary school, that I see. kind of thing. Yeah, that and, makes a big you know, difference. And my old man's a lawyer. That, so, you know, these things. Expectations. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the idea for me, where the way I ended up doing law was basically just being competitive and being smart mm. and not wanting to waste my grades. When not I, wanting to waste the grades. Yeah. yeah. So 
Anyway, we both so we both ended up there. We both ended up working together later down the track. We did. And, and I, the thing that I admired in terms of working with you was, and particularly since, was that you were obviously always cognizant of the fact that you know you were leading this project, which was a software development project, but you know only one guy on the team know, knew how to code yeah. and it was a which was a terrible it, idea in hindsight well, yeah of course of course <laughs> but you learn these things when it's your first yeah enterprise. you do you do that's what it's for but i think you realized that in order to be a proper leader you need to be able to do all the aspects of the thing that yeah. you're leading i mean so i actually hate people talking about leadership yeah yeah so i not to diss on you because I can see absolutely why you would consider it leadership because by any definition of the term, yeah, I suppose I was the one who was most obsessed with it. Definitely. Mm. Um, you assembled the team as well. That, you, that's, it was your, it was like yeah, your idea. Yeah. So all of those things. You brought everyone together. Yeah. I, actually, so you, but I just you're, really, I, I don't like discussion about leadership. But you're, you're, you're discarding this mantle of, of like a yeah, I am. Lead, leading the project quite and, explicitly. And I find that hilarious because it's so obvious that you were. Um, yeah, and I'm really interesting. What I'm interested in why you're disavowing. So actually, leadership, I think I think and particularly when it comes to creativity, like we're yeah. making something. So why why don't you like this term? I think because actually, in some sense, um, to the extent that the leadership was required or what you would classically consider to be leadership, I think it pointed at some of the flaws in our plan. And maybe if uh, less leadership had, requ had been required, we would, we, had, we would have had less flaws. So I suppose I almost feel like leadership has to fill in the gaps where you've got problems that you should have seen to in other ways. Does that make sense? Mm, no, uh, I look, just feel that way about it. Well, I, so I'll just give you my... Because the rest of us should have had more technical skill. That's right. I mean, for sure. Yeah. And the thing is that... And the fact that we needed a person to kind of coordinate skills, really that was like making up for a shortcoming that we all had, me most of all, that like we didn't have technical skills or enough yeah. technical skills. No, I agree. So I suppose I, I just, I bounce back against the leadership thing mainly because of all of the rubbish that's often associated with a discussion of that stuff. Sure. And, and I'm not saying that you're having no, that no, discussion. No, no, no. I, I, the thing that I'm interested in though is that when you're when you are leading a creative project it's a it's a difficult position because you it's if you're responsible for the for the direction of an idea Maybe, can but I, you can't hmm. you can't you're not fully capable of controlling its execution so when you're working in a team yes and you're making something yeah but you're not capable of taking over any single person's job and sure. just doing it and yeah. showing them how it's done i think that's a different I think that's a different story to how most people want to lead. And so that's, that's why I think you're hesitating to say, oh yeah, I was the leader because you were, you've sent some deficiency in your own capabilities. To Definitely do the at the job. time I did. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so, which is what I, I was so heavily motivated after that yes. to learn how to do it hmm. because I felt almost some sense of, uh, it felt fraudulent on some level to be involved heavily in from the outset of a technology project without really understanding the technology and just relying on someone else to have to do all of that work, which was really the most important work and should have been the majority of the work that was done. So and that was Tristan and Tristan worked like a machine and he was actually never anything but gracious about it. Oh yeah. Um, he was a champion. Yeah. And, and but it was very motivating to have to have to work through someone else's hands and even at times put pressure on them and feeling a bit skeezy about that because there was no way that I could sort of do the same thing that he was doing. Yeah, that's right. That really motivated me to learn it because I knew that that was the area I wanted to go into and I had to know if I was going to go into that area. I, I agree. And the, the reason why I find this conversation about leadership in a creative realm interesting is, is for a couple of reasons. It, a lot of people assume and a lot of the bullshit around leadership mm. that you describe divorces capability in the realm of the activity that you're doing mm. from the ability to inspire. You know? Yeah, so that's so stuff I hate. I, I agree because I think that true leadership is, uh, you know, like 
the respect of people to lead is earned. Hmm. And so I think where you do have, like the most effective leaders to me, the ones that I'm most inspired by, um, for example, you know, uh, I work for a guy who runs a DJ company called XY DJ mm. and he's an excellent boss because he can do every aspect of the job. Yeah. He's the guy, you know, he can take bookings, make them, he can DJ, you know, he just basically, he, he can do all aspects of the thing mm. and then he now just has a team of people and he manages them really well. His communication's wonderful, all that sort of thing. And so I think that that's a good example of a leader where you can lead by example it's not like he's out there trying to inspire us be- because he's just doing it. It just, I mean, there's also an element, I think, of if you're going to coordinate or run something, I tend to talk about like running my law firm or running a company. Yeah. I don't really talk about leading it. I mean, I would say I run it. Like I kind of coordinate bits and pieces. And it is always it always felt really skeezy to me to tell Lopes that something wasn't good enough if I couldn't do the thing that I was saying wasn't good enough. Yeah. You know? So this was like actually a really important thing for motivating me to learn how to code. And that was really just messing around and teaching myself on the internet. Mm. Um, I did that for probably six months and got good enough to start building bits and pieces. And then I took a part-time job at uh, a law firm, a smaller law firm, and kept my hand in the game and sort of honestly unintentionally built up a bit of a practice within that law firm in technology because that's what I was interested in and uh, continued to work as a uh, um, as a, a software developer building my own projects. Um, and in the end, after a lot of trial and error and messing around and getting better, um, you know, I built a system for creating legal documents, which I think is really important um, because I think we have very limited options at the moment. You can choose a sociopathic um, corporate entity and you can do business that way or you can go into a partnership and share risk with people uh, in unreasonable ways. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Or you can do joint ventures which are a bit more complicated and require a lot of heavy lifting. Like it just seems to me like we have explored the space or the possible space for formal structures um, really superficially. Yes. And that actually there are probably many interesting structures for human collaboration that we could invent if we had the ability to fiddle with legal principles a bit more. And the problem being that right now, the cost of innovation is five to $600 an hour to pay a guy to copy and paste slabs of text from one document into another document and hope that nothing goes wrong. Yeah. And this is a terrible environment to come up with new ideas in. So I suppose we're really interested in the idea of exploring the space of ways for people to work together and to concoct business arrangements um, to create more win-wins, to perhaps deal with some of the pathologies of the current system uh, without compromising the ability to generate wealth using these new models. And we can't get to the point where we can experiment and do all the trial and error and tighten the loop of learning until we have the ability to, until we have tools that allow us to create new things cheaply and quickly and discard them if and improve them to the extent mm. that they, they do work. Because it's this, I mean, that was, I suppose, one of the most interesting things to me about the creative process of like building digital systems um, was how much trial and error there is. It's like counterintuitive how much there is. I just did not expect it. I, I, I think that it's really interesting the, the sort of watching you from the outside. Yeah. Being sort of like part of these journeys from, you know, going. Well, from, we are always checking in every few yeah, months. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, working together, firstly working together um, opposite each other yeah. in the law firm and then working together on uh, Key, the ill-fated yeah. software ill-fated. Exerso- yeah. exercise. And then seeing you start to learn to build stuff and then the first thing you showed me was the uh, Super Pleb. That's it. Which is this thing that you built. Now, I just want to have a little sidebar. I was talking to a very good friend of mine last night, Michael Joseph, 
who is a academic. He's right. in he's now in Yale. Yeah. Teaching political science. Okay. <laughs> and he's a hilarious guy. He um just as a sidebar to one of our conversations, he came up with this idea and he called it marriage justice. Uh. And I actually looked at marriagejustice.com. It's not available. It's cost 1200 bucks. I think they want to sell it to like some it would be a great dot com for a um like a, a divorce attorney or something in the sure. US. But his idea was basically it sounded like super pleb. Sure. It was basically like uh let's say you have a married couple and they have a tiff. They get 200 words each. Yeah. And then you each have the propositions and then yeah. and then people can vote. Yeah. And then decide like who has won this argument. So there's now, yeah. And so uh, uh you know the the fact that you can even in the process of learning to code, like you learning to code, come up with something that I thought was like instantly, I was like, when Mike, when Mike was talking about this thing, kind of as a joke, but also really, you know, kind of serious. Mm. I was thinking this thing that Pat built is basically that system. Yeah. And, and this thing that you built to kind of upvote and downvote political propositions, propositions yeah. could easily be applied to sorting out, you know, marital... <laughs> it could be Marital applied to tips. many different things, which is why it was so interesting. And, and also this, this thing that you're building, that, that leads me into this other thing, which, which is as someone who does creative writing, this thing that you've built, TreeScribe, uh, formerly known as CodePact, which is a you know dynamic system for building a, a legal document, mm. has potentially enormous potential for other applications in other areas where you can, where you want to make choices to dynamically create things. And some of those things might even be like choose your own adventure stories where you make choices and then that. Yeah, that could be. I mean, it, 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 pretty much anything with optionality in it. Yeah. It, it just does optional text in very powerful ways. Mm. Um, it's so, but like, I'm sort of, I suppose, less interested talking about TreeScribe itself than the creative process of making it. Sure. Because, like, you know, when I, s I sell the thing day to day to law firms, businesses, so I talk about it a lot. Sure. As a job. But not. And so it's actually, it's really nice to have the opportunity to talk to you about actually building the thing and, like, sort of, in some sense, trying to allow for its creation. And... Um, the, the fertile ground from which it sprang is a, yeah. from an idea to a, a thing that is to actually really, like a tree now. To feel like a vehicle for an idea to emerge into the world. Mm. I mean, you must have the same sensation yourself if you're making music or poetry. Um, but that's really how it feels to me. And it's actually also, I'd say, without a hint of irony, the closest I've ever come to a kind of an experience of the divine or the otherworldly. Yeah. Now that sounds ridiculous in the context of like building a system to create legal docs. No, but it, does, it doesn't sound ridiculous to me. Like in terms of having an idea grow and, and to almost feel like a separate part of you needs to be made manifest and to become obsessed with that and do the work required to make it manifest, you know, about as close as I feel like I'll ever be to feeling like a wizard. <laughs> Wizardry. Yeah. There's no, there's no doubt that, there's, if you're doing creative work well, there's an element of mysteriousness to it because there's a sense in which you have come up with an idea that you didn't, you yourself, that existed somehow and has sprung from you that you didn't anticipate you could come up with. Yeah. And that That's sort of interplay between what's in your head and the reality as you build it and like that little feedback loop that establishes it kind of ends up looking different to how you expected it at the outset, but still the ultimate result comes from the interaction between you and the thing you build as you build it. Of course. And the, the process of reflecting on what already, what you've already made, where you want to get to yeah, the skills that you possess <laughs> that get you that to get you there, yeah. the things that you might need to learn. And then even along the way, realizing that where you're trying to get to, was maybe not even the best solution. Yeah. And that you could, you know, just a little to the left and some accidental shit 
that completely that, that oh, takes man, you I've by surprise. Oh man, I've had so many of those things, and those, in some sense, are the most delicious parts of making something. Serendipity. Yeah, when you uh, don't, when you're just sort of noodling around with a thing, and it feels like them, there's some potential over there. But you're not sure what it is. You press for time. Oh, I've got a lot of things that I know are going to give me some results, but I just have this itch. I've got to scratch it. And then you kind of mess around and something pops out that on some level you knew was there, um, but you weren't sure. And it was a risk to even go in that direction because you've got so much other shit you should be doing. And, you know, those things can be decisive, totally decisive. It feels really like you're sort of panning for gold almost. Yeah, no, I completely relate. One of the things, I mean, when when I made my first record that we put on vinyl, unfortunately, this track wasn't able to be put on vinyl because yep. it opened, it, it, you know, I wrote this song called What Is Music. I the, loved that song. <laughs> yeah. And I remember that one. The well. sample, it's like got a weird sample at the start. It's like, whoa, 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 yeah, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. And that was just a, I was just on some website where you can, it's, it's kind of like a sound generator yeah. and you can kind of just like pull these poles of frequencies in different directions and it just creates sound as you do that. Nice. And I was recording, I was recording like as I was doing it and I just happened to make that exact, like that exact thing. And then I wrote the entire song around this random surprise type thing hmm. This you know, unintentional experiment that I was doing um, which was kind of for me emblematic of the song because what the entire song was about is how I'd already written the lyrics and the kind of I had melodies in mind and stuff but the mystery of of actually having something come from nothing come to you and then result in something yeah is super powerful and and there are different ways to manifest too exactly like those those things that like peek out from the mist in front of you and you're like not sure but it feels like there's something over over there in that fog and i'm just gonna walk a few steps to see if i can see a bit more clearly and see if it's worth my while walking another few steps and then you find the thing and there it is the perfect little bauble of an idea that solves a problem that you've been stressing about in the back of your mind for months. I mean, there was one particular instance of that that really stands out to me. And then you have those weird shower moments where you just like, you walk, you basically turn on the water and then you're sort of like chilling in the shower and then something just like pops out. Yeah. Everyone's had the shower thing. It's mm. fascinating. I, I love that because it's the, I feel like that's the subconscious working on the problem. Yeah. Without your knowledge. that's So that's fascinating to me as well. The whole idea, like when you wake up in the middle of the night and there's something in your head yeah. um, or when you wake up in the morning and there was a problem that was stressing the fuck out of you the evening before and now there's just an answer neatly arranged. We call it, like if we are worried about a decision or something that we're having difficulty figuring out, we just say, leave it to the elves. Yeah, sleep and, on it. Yeah. And it's almost, it does feel weirdly like there are elves in your head that come and do the job while you're not looking and you walk back into that room in your mind the next day and there it is, just like arranged for you. Mm. And it's totally bizarre because we think of ourselves as these unitary consciousnesses and it is the best indicator in my life, like in terms, like experientially, um, that really there are many things in my head that are not me. Sure. And yeah. I feel like it's hard to see that otherwise and that actually the creative process is the thing that's highlighted it to me the most. Because mm. it's I, not me that comes up with a lot of the stuff. Weirdly. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Well, I, I feel like that sense of, I mean, this, is, this gets a bit Buddhist as well. The idea sure. that yeah. you kind of, you have an ego and then, you know, the process of meditation is this idea of silencing the discussion and the talk the chatter, like the monkey mind mm. of your ego, the surface level that's always trying to talk to you. And then meditation is supposed to be the process of quietening that down. And then, but then the question is like, who is it or what is it? What part of your consciousness is the bit that's quietening it down? Mm. Isn't it all the same thing? But when you do achieve a sense of quietude and you can silence the chatter, it's, it's not like you have a different mind. 
it seems to be like the same. It, it, it's not like you, it's some kind of schizophrenic experience, but it's qualitatively extremely different. When you achieve a state where you just don't have the chatter and you're focused on your breath and you're just thinking of nothing, mm. <laughs> yet there is still a sense that you're present. You know, you're still there, in fact, but it's a deeper sense of being there. And that to me is fascinating because there's all these different ways to conceive of what's happening you can either you can name it or you cannot there's in in a lot of ways this semantic discussion of what what you're actually trying to do and what's really happening is irrelevant mm. the the main thing is that it's an experience that shows there are different qualities of way that you can interact with the world one is one that's purer where you are hyper focused on a really narrow set of experiences like the breath or just you know empty you know emptying your mind and mm. and our bodies and our beings are so diverse and there's so many different processes that are happening subconsciously and unconsciously that you have to wonder is the is most of our rational mind just automatic behavior that we are subsequently rationalizing you know the yeah, idea that the that's, idea that the, the idea that we don't really know what we're doing but we're kind of puppets that are puppets to the <laughs> subterranean forces yeah yeah, yeah. Pu puppets to our subconscious but we kind of just have like a narrative that it follows close on the heels yeah. of, of our actions that are like i know why i did that i'm I'm fully in control. It's like, remember that old Marxist idea of the substructure that drives everything in the superstructure, which is kind of the thin layer that's viewable by the world that is just kind of the end result or manifestation or the skin on top of the, the substructure doing all of the work. Yeah. I, I sort of, you know, Marxism is not my jam, but I always really liked the, uh, the, the theoretical descriptions. It felt like actually it gave me some vocabulary for discussing ideas that I didn't have before I looked at it in political science. Mm. I studied that. I thought it was worthwhile. You know? There's no, there's no doubt. I, th I think that um, political analysis of, you know, people's behavior, there's so many different ways to analyze people's behavior from yeah. so many different perspectives. I always feel like the perspectives are just kind of a cross section of the whole thing. So, you know, you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, you get one cross-section. You look at it from an economic standpoint, you get another cross-section. Well, you look at it as sociological. I mean, and we, all of these are totally integrable. Integratable? Is that even a word? Yeah, that's totally a word. Okay. They're all integratable. I, I feel I like feel, there's I, another way to say that word that's probably better. But integral, maybe. Integral? No. No. Integratable. I mean, like, possible to be integrated. Let's get, know. let's get as hung up on semantics as we possibly can. Sorry, man. No, no, that's all right. I just wanted to have a brief aside. You were talking about sort of creativity being a experience of the, you know, grand mysteries and the divine almost. Ye well, as in close some, as I've ever experienced. In some yeah. aspects. I mean, I, yeah. I feel that very strongly. And those words are loaded, but to the extent that I've ever experienced anything that I would put in those, those categories, sure. as I've heard them explained, besides creation would be in there. Yeah. Sure. Besides other kinds of psychedelic experiences, perhaps, but... Yeah, true. But what I uh, the thing that I wanted to although actually no, I would say creativity to me has been more mystical than even like anything I've ingested. experienced with psychedelics. And I've never done anything stronger than magic mushrooms, by the way. That should sure. be said. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, the thing that I think is important or, or interesting when it comes to just a conception of what's happening when we are exploring ideas. For me, I consider creativity and and my art that I do and writing and music akin to a spiritual practice. Like I don't go to church, mm. but there is something mysterious that you can commune with. Yeah. I feel that sense in which when you're writing something or doing something that you don't feel entirely the author of. Like I feel That's like a nice way to put it. You don't feel entirely the author of. Yeah. I love like that it's a formulation. confluence of like subconscious um, you know, inspiration, um, all of the discipline and work that's gone into you, being able to have the tools to even 
express yourself in this yeah. manner. And so, also like that feedback between other people and the thing you've created. That's a weird element to it. Definitely. And it's a weird one in our industry as well because we have like kind of creepy ways of measuring how people interact with things. That in they do. software engineering. In software stuff, yeah. Sure. It's creepy what you can figure out and how much of an insight you can get into someone's personality as they use a product. Yeah, I that doesn't that doesn't really surprise me. Um, well, look at this point; it's actually pretty old news. I mean, it's uh, it's a great thing that everyone is now considering how much information large technology companies should have, um, and I suppose tech companies, including mine, will continue to do something if it works and mm -hmm. if it's helpful to the people who are using the product, so they like it more. Yeah. And you know. People say, well, why don't you just not do it if you are worried about it being creepy? And I think that it's important for people to understand that when you're competing, there's a collective action problem where there's an arms race and you've got to do what you've got to do to make sure that you don't go out of business. And that's what governments are for, to solve that collect collective action problem, to stop someone having to unilaterally disarm. Because unilaterally disarming is stupid. Yeah, if you want to be, um, you want to go into a fight, you know, a knife fight. Well, if you're, you know, with, yeah, your arms tied not to get too uh, violent with the imagery, but if you're competing in a market, it makes no sense to be the only guy who's going to like abide by constraints. It just doesn't make sense. So I really would like the government to get more active in regulating. Actually, nothing would make me happier than if we all had to follow stricter rules. Yeah, it's interesting. I think in the future, the way the EU privacy stuff... And can I also just say for the record, not yeah. stricter rules in the sense of turning us into limbs of the surveillance state like the idiot Australian government recently did. Oh, yeah, that is I, that I mean, nonsense? like actually just regulating how uh, personal information can be used for commercial purposes. Just sorry. Yeah, I caveat. feel like a sensible regulation would be informing users explicitly, requiring their consent explicitly before they, you know, before it can be... Yeah, collected. It would also be nice um, if the uh, if the government would just be a bit more gutsy in terms of enforcement across the spectrum. Yeah, of course. Well, there's you know we that, that's a that's a rabbit hole. Yeah, can I just like I'll just say banking royal commission. There's no other words I need in to say to talk about how lax the regulators have in been. Insurance, please. Next. Yeah. Insurance royal commission. Anyway, um, that's all pretty dry stuff yeah but let's get back to creation well yeah and so i think that what's interesting is depending on you know how hyper rational your perspective of reality is a lot of people would be dismissing you know talk of divinity and communion with some grand mystery as you know kind of nonsense talk but for me this idea that creativity is like an expression of your individual self and beyond is one of the most important aspects of it, which is why I like talking to people who make stuff. To the extent that ideas emerge from nowhere, seemingly, they're coming from something that is connected to your consciousness that you don't have agency over. Full agency, no. Or, I mean... You, the, the thing Maybe you can feed things into it, but you don't have agency over how it operates. I feel like at least thing, to me, that's how it feels. I, I I don't think you have agency over the output. I think what you can do for sure is you can engineer and dedicate yourself dedicate yourself to building the skills through discipline and learning, education and dedication to being having the tools, you know, mastery of of a, as you know, sort of a spectrum of ability that allows you to achieve certain outputs that you couldn't do without that prerequisite. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, I think that's the thing that. Cr uh, so, creativity for me, I think to a large degree, has an interesting relationship with um, a kind of opposite trait. You know, people who are hyper creative are often, you know. <laughs> stereotypically bad you know like messy people and mm. bad at organization and that kind of thing 
but actually some of the best creators that I know, the most effective ones, the ones that produce amazing shit are actually like polymath type people who have very rigidly structured lives Mm. who are incredibly disciplined, who practice their craft, you know, hone their skills. And these are all um, qualities that sort of don't jibe with the sort of traditional lazy muso who gets up at yeah. day. And, um, you know, there, there's certainly lots of brilliance to be had in that kind of... Uh, well, I've always felt like creativity requires phases. Sure. So I have a clear distinction in my work patterns. It's so nice to be able to talk to you about this because I don't get to talk to many people about creativity, as I said before. Like, there's a real difference for me between the... Um, like pure creativity where it's literally just me with a notebook or a phone staring into space, thinking of things. And as notes occur to me, just writing them down and going back later to curate, to curate them. But it needs to be a kind of a free flow sort of just, uh, what's the word? Free association. Stream of consciousness. Yeah. yeah. And ideas just go, you know, they just kind of present themselves one after the other and you just write them down and you tend to make progression through the act of writing them down. Then I've got kind of like phases that I call, at least to me, in my head, I call them loosey goosey, where it's like, I've got some design work to do. I've got to figure out how to present a data structure visually that makes sense to people. Um, that kind of work is just something that I need to do a lot of walking with. Yeah, I'm going to sit down at a desk for maybe 10, 15 minutes, but I need to walk for another 15. Um, And then, you know, maybe sit down for an hour and then perhaps call it a day at 2 p.m. and just let the brain kind of work on whatever it is that came out of that day. And then a much more sort of rigid phase of execution and implementation and just like turning all of these things into operative computer code which is basically just mathematical notation so that's a completely different world um, of just like total rigidity predictability and to the extent that there are problems it's your fault because the system is so constrained in some way and testing as well yeah and absolute software testing i mean that's a whole other discussion i won't bore your audience with it but actually like (laughs) software testing is fucking interesting there's a lot about it that forces you to think in ways to test something it needs to make sense and actually you can write code quite easily that doesn't make a great deal of sense when you come back to it that's really easy to do mm-hmm. so software testing actually forces you to create these beautiful sort of discrete composable like things that can sort of work together well functions and you know to um build a better system that way and that's inherently satisfying to me at least and I suppose to a lot of guys who work in that area, and many of them are guys, um, but um, to any coders, including the lady coders out there, it's a beautiful thing to build an elegant computer system. Sure, I, I, I'm really attracted to this idea that you have where you have different like working modes. Yes, yeah, phases are completely crucial, man, for me. Yeah. yeah, and by the way, to go back to the education piece, yeah, I feel like that's what the education system is not good at contemplating. For sure. Like even just because those phases can last from anything from a day through to like a month, depending on like. And I think one thing that you have to learn independently of the education system is a kind of uh, system of goal creation. Yeah. And pursuit. So you don't get taught in school how to figure out what you're good at, how to set goals, how to, you know, establish projects. You know work work in a team cohesively to achieve a task that is um generated by the team you know could i will say at the primary school i attended a small catholic school called st bernard's on the south coast um there were two or three teachers and they had this system of teaching called contracts funnily enough and what it was was like a list of 10 activities that all shared a common theme or they would all focus on like a book. And you kind of had two weeks of classwork to complete these 10 activities. And then you would get like a mark out of 10 for each of the 10. And it was actually an amazingly effective way of teaching a kid how to sort of just make compromises. I've got a limited amount of time. Here's what I need to do. 
I want to do a good job at everything, but I can't get overly obsessed with one thing because there are a bunch of other things competing for my attention that also need doing. And maybe I have preference for which of those tasks I enjoy more than the others, but it doesn't matter. They all need to get done. They all contribute to the overall output. And in the end, my little mark out of 100 is going to depend on all of them, even if I don't like them. And that way of teaching, I don't know how widespread that is, but I remember it between the years three and five. So what, between between 10 and 12, perhaps? Something like that. Something like that, nine and 11. And that, I think, massively shaped the way that I approach work, actually. So Glenda Murray, shout out to my teacher from year three, that's that ha- that left a lasting impression on how I approach stuff, definitely. That's really, that's interesting. Yeah, it, it was amazingly independent though. They would literally just give you this list of tasks and they would say, you got two weeks to do that. Good luck. Yeah, that certainly wasn't a part of my... And they were always there to help, by the way. So it wasn't like... An, I don't feel like even in hindsight, it was an abdication of responsibility. I wouldn't take a cynical view of it. Um, and they marked them and they paid attention to them. They gave us good comments. They told us where we'd fallen down. It was actually pretty good. Yeah, that's that sounds fascinating. I certainly... I mean, I went to a selective like opportunity class in years five and six of my primary schooling. Yeah. And we did, we kind of didn't get regular marks for stuff. Yeah. Which was terrible because I just neglected maths just because I hated it. Sure. And we didn't have, we got homework, but it wasn't like marked. If they, I mean, when you're dealing with kids, if there's no feedback loop, because there's nothing real that happens as a result of the work that you but do. No, here, the only feedback mechanism is the mark. There one, must be a mark. Here's one thing that that um, that we that we were taught. Instead of getting a kind of end of year, um, like kind of report card, because this was some particular phase in education where you know like rigorous marking was not um, wasn't favoured. Oh, fa yeah. yeah. And so at the end of the year, we had to produce these things called like our work portfolio. Okay. Okay. Yep. And so for the most of the year, you know. For a kid, that's too distant. Yeah, you know, that's right. And so basically for the last two or three weeks of our classes, we'd be all like furiously scrambling to try and figure out. Inevitably. Yeah. And so what we learned to do, what some certain kids that were, you know, so some really diligent kids would be like building their portfolio all year. Yeah. And it would just be chock a block. Like the la- their last part of school would be kind of shuffling all the work they'd done in all the pages of, because th- this thing maybe had 50 pages. We all had like a folder sure. with those slip, yeah. those plastic Yeah, I remember sleeves. those well, yeah. Yeah, and so the diligent kids who had kind of assembled all their work yep. would be choosing, you know, which 50 things to put in. Which are the best, the best yeah, of the yeah, best. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. right. Whereas the more enterprising idiots... <laughs> padding content and stuff. No, 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 quite no? the opposite. Right. They figured out how to open the folder and take out pages. So you would... Oh, so, so there would, was there's less stuff in excise, total. You would excise 20 and so you only had to put 30 pages gotcha. of stuff in. And which teacher is noticing that at 10.30 at night? Probably, yeah, I don't know. But the, po- the point being that we didn't even get a mark. Like, it wasn't like we got an A or a B or a C. Yeah. You just had to look like your thing was full. And yeah. So kids just figured that out. But that's, that's could- the thing with marks, to just go back to that point, because it's an interesting one, I think, anyway, that because your work matters not a fucking jot <laughs> in the world when you're in a school, the only kind of feedback you get for trial and error is what the teacher says about it. Yeah. And that can be arbitrary and shitty, but actually it's the best you've got when the stuff that you do doesn't matter. True. Um, but I feel like the interesting thing that in terms of... You're depriving of, kids of something important if you don't give them marks, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Something to strive towards. Um, and But also, just that system really laid bare how much we were wasting our time. We're talking about smart kids. You know, yeah. we, we, we were good at doing lots of stuff. Um, it also so kind of makes sense, though, as an adult, a little bit to be cynical about your story and go, well, those are teachers who know they've got smart kids <laughs> and they're perhaps not working as hard as they otherwise would if they felt like 
Um, they needed to bring us up to speed. If they felt like there were real consequences, if they felt like there was going something bad would happen if they if they didn't work hard. I mean, I'm just spitballing here, but like, why would teachers who are teaching smart kids be so lazy? Other yeah, than to I, just think, oh, it's going to be all right. They're smart. They'll be right. You know, they come from good homes. That's yeah, why they're that's, here. It's probably that's probably a fair point. I mean, you don't think about that when you're a youngster. You definitely don't. It's always fascinating to look back as an adult on some of the stuff that happened at school and go, oh, yeah, okay, I see what was happening in adult world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. The idea that your behavior is often a consequence of an abrogation of responsibility. For yeah, there's, I mean, I look back, I think actually I was quite lucky. The schools that I went to were okay. Yeah, um, me too, 100%. And, you know, what was a huge culture shock for me was coming from a South Coast, like parish high school, which is a pretty small school, um, to like a private school in Sydney, boarding school for the last three years. And that was, I mean, I just could not believe that this school had a rowing boat. Not just a rowing boat, a fleet of yep. rowing boats. This to me was incomprehensible. Yeah. Uh, a, that was a, like quite a bizarre thing to encounter at 16 years old. It's a weird world. I mean, It was weird. It's funny because I, I, you know, went to a, I, I went to public schools you know, my whole life, right. but they were good, you know, they were all selective and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, as in from the last, from year five onwards, I was in Summer Hill Opportunity Class or whatever, and then Sydney High, which despite being a Povo public school, also had a rowing program. Um, right. And so for, for, for me, the thing that I really appreciated about the school that I went to was that we were in, firstly, there was an, uh, an atmosphere of excellence mm. that you were competing against other students who are also really good. Yep. And previously I'd felt like I was just a, I was the smartest kid in the room or whatever in terms, in certain areas like English and stuff, I was always good. But um, when you, I feel like when you're in, when you're in an, an environment that has a higher level of expectation, you raise I agree with that. You step to the... You and step kids are the very point. sensitive to whether or not something is expected of them. Yes. And of course, they're going to like fuck off if they don't feel like there's something expected of them. I, I feel like just to kind of shoehorn this back into the, the yeah, creative discussion, yeah. the thing that I found difficult when I went from a very rigidly structured competitive environment as a high school where you're literally ranked, like you give, you get your rank as a number. It's like mm. you're first in English, you're last in English, mm. you know, all, and you get the numbers all the way down, you know, mm. up and you get updates between, you know, you get four reports a year. Right. And your, your that's great changes that goes up and yeah. yeah. So that's crazy. Yeah. But I was so, I was so competitive. I was like, I want to be top five in all my courses. Sure. And I ended up getting pretty close. Mm. And then I went, and then when you go to uni, suddenly that's all gone. Like mm. all you might find out is by, it's all secret. There's no publication. Mm. You find out your grade, you might talk to other people that you know, and they might tell you theirs, but otherwise they don't, they don't have to. Sure. You don't know. Yeah. Suddenly all of my motivation to compete and be the best was dead. Really? Yeah. I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to make sure that I was in, you know, like not getting passes. Mm. Like I wanted to get distinctions and above and stuff, mm. but you know what? Like, I didn't want to be number one. Hmm. I didn't care about that anymore. But also, it, also there was also there was beer. Do you think though? I'm I'm just interested. Like, do you think that it's a different energy creating things artistically than the competitive energy that I suppose you did a lot of creation with as a kid, trying to win at those games? Well, it's funny because. The, the answer that I'll give ha has to do with when you can create things competitively, yeah. like Poetry Slam, right. which I did well in for a while until I decided not to do it anymore. Uh -huh. And things like band comps and stuff. So... Is that a good energy for you? Do you feel no. like you thrive with that? No, because competing no? artistically, I feel, is silly. Right. I think it's great. The thing that I like about artistic competitions like Poetry Slams is that people give a shit. Yeah. When you have an open mic that's not ranked or whatever, sure, you know people do their thing, and you know it's great, it's open. But when people turn up to a competition where the prize is like you win a book deal or whatever, you get flown to China to go to a literary yeah, festival, people sure, show up. 
Sure. You know, they bring their A game. And I appreciate that. Yeah. But I feel like the problem with artistic competitions is that people create, you know, it's in the same way that when you take students and you rank them, you teach to the test and kids learn to the test. Yeah. You write for the rank. You write for the judges. It you seems like authenticity is really crucial for art. And to the extent that you're writing for judges or whatever, then that's compromising authenticity. To a degree, it's very possible. And the problem is, I don't judge people who do it, but I found it very creatively unsatisfying. Particularly Did you, you found it unsatisfying because you felt the pull of it? And that was an influence that you didn't like or resented having? I've, no, it's more that... I, I actually, because I would write with no regard for whether or not things would score well. Sure. And I would see people that I would judge had done that hmm. do better than I would do. But also the arbitrariness of certain things about competitive arts. So, for example... Well, in, we, can I just uh, yeah, interrupt for a moment? Yeah, of like course. I think that the innate discomfort with competitive artistic pursuits like a good example of it is the oscars yeah and the idea of like campaigning for an award people always talk about that with a kind of curl in the lip or a dismissive tone because the idea i think just very on a, on a very deep level of competing in artistic pursuits strikes people as gross it is gross because gross, what's gross so. about it is that it doesn't matter how the competition is structured it will affect the outcome Mm. by its nature. So the Oscars is a very um, rarefied, stratified type of system where the judges are known. Yep. They are, can be, you know, they can be wooed and approached because and, they're publicly known. Now, in Poetry Slam, it's the almost the total opposite, which is that uh, in Poetry Slams, the judges are picked randomly from the audience. Yeah. And that has a, a that has like a sure. couple of impacts. So damned if you know them, damned if you don't. Well, so what poetry slam where it's judged by the audience? That's really good at growing a poetry audience yeah. because people are far more likely to turn out to see an amateur poet if they're in like a serious competition and they're going to like maybe win something. Hmm. So like their friends and relatives are going to show up, and if your friends and relatives show up, see in in good numbers, that actually increases your chance of winning if they're selected to judge you yeah so there's that element that will of it. make a difference yes yep. so there's that element of people also are incentivized to bring people i'm really by the way enjoying watching your creative juices flow a little i'm sorry your competitive juices flow oh yeah a no no because you're talking is... about these systems for competition and all of a sudden there's a rigidity about you that's actually not usual to you in my experience <laughs> You're like listing out all of the criteria and how this shit works. No, that's right. Because I, I see the competitive school kid. Yeah. Interestingly, I was a beneficiary of this when I first went in my first poetry slam. Yeah. So the first poetry slam I ever went in, I'd just come back from Burning Man and I had met this guy who runs the Australian poetry slam, Miles Merrill. He's a lovely guy, does great work. Mm. And I'd met him previously when I was doing radio stuff at FBI and I sat next to him. I was in this very open, set, you know, open frame of mind. I'd just been to Burning Man for the first time. So I was yeah. like, wow. A year ago, uh, sorry, a week ago, I was like, you know, semi-naked running around the desert. Now I'm on the train in the way to work. Mm. And I saw this guy who organized poetry stuff. And so I was like, I latched onto him immediately. Oh, he just happened to be on the train. He happened to be on the train. And so I sat next to him and I was like, okay. oh, hey, Miles, I remember you. Do you remember me? Blah, blah, blah. We did radio poetry stuff. What have you got going on? He said, well, you know, we've got the Australian Poetry Slam coming up. Um, in, uh, you know, you should, the, the next heat is here, you should go. And so I went and there's a thing where in poetry slams, um, the audience gets picked randomly. Yeah. So the judges get picked randomly. And so if, if you're in like the first half, they, the judges haven't calibrated their scores yet. Sure, yeah. Because basically the first person, it's a bit of a yo -yo. the first person they're never going to give a 10. No. they don't know what a 10 looks like. Even if like. they are, they do yes, happen to be the best exactly person. and that's exactly what happened because the, uh, the guy who performed first yeah. was a guy who's a very good mate of mine called Tim Kent. And that's, I met him that night and he's a beautiful dude, amazing poet, amazing muso, and amazing creator. Mm. Uh, he, he's an incredible director and he's just a lovely bloke. And he performed his poet, poem first yep. and it was amazing. And right. he got like, you know, he was doomed. He got like 7.5, 7.5, oh, 7.5. No. 7 and I was like, dude, that's amazing. He should have won. There's no way he can win. 
I performed last. Everyone was calibrated. That's like the ideal spot to be. Sure. I got like good scores and I was in the, I went into the next round. Yeah. So that for me, um, I saw the injustice of it and I was a beneficiary of it. Yeah. The like, it's the a way conflicting. that conflicting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but I was thinking, you know, I guess this is okay. I, well, you know, I got through. The most important thing about that was that I met all the poets. Like I met all the people. I saw all the people. And some yep. of the people I met that night, you know, I met people. I, I met like Jessie Ray who ran Art Party and she invited me to perform. And it just kind of like opened up this whole creative uh, outlet of people doing awesome art shit in Sydney that was previously not available to me. That's great. And so, but what I love about competitive art is that it gets you to show up. And what is frustrating about it is that regardless of how well you design um, the criteria, mm. it's very, very difficult to have a meritocracy mm. because art is so subjective. It is totally subjective. And the thing that would be ideal is if you could have some way to harness that competitive energy where people are like inspired to give it their yeah. all and show up. Well, we kind of have that in the market, it, just in the and, marketplace. And for the winners not to matter. And for the winner not to matter. So what would be ideal in my world mm. is if the winner of the Poetry Slam comes out and says, well, you know, I'm happy to be here on the ABC or be interviewed or go to this literary festival, but I need to let you know how arbitrary it is for me to be here. Because there are lots of people who are, you know, probably just as good who were in the first half of the comp <laughs> mm. and they couldn't get the votes because the, of the design. Now that would be, <laughs> that would be like the pinnacle of uh, an integrity and I completely understand why no one would do it. And if I ever won, I probably wouldn't do it either mm. because nobody wants to hear that. You want to hear that someone is a champion. Everyone suspends their disbelief in competitive structures. Correct. To enjoy the outcome of them. Yes. And, and it's and not a bad thing. Of course, inherently. because it's because the idea is that ultimately without that competition mm. and without the idea that, you know, like th thousands of people competed and one person won. Yeah. And let's hear their poem. I feel like it's a little bit the origin of why people don't want to know about drug cheating. You know how you quite often hear people say, ah, oh, just, just let cares? them do it. Yeah, just yeah, let yeah. them do it. Like it's this sort of suspension of disbelief. Like I don't want to know what goes into the sausage. Just do cool stuff compete have all of the the triggers and the enjoyment and, yeah. for that and don't tell me how the sausage is made i don't want to know yeah because competition brings can can really bring out the best but when you're in a pure you know open field for example mm. so if you're like we're a band we put out a record theoretically our record is competing against all the other records for sales and attention and all that sure, kind of stuff yeah that's a kind of competition that I fucking cannot abide. I cannot get into that. And I can't, I mean, when it's an open marketplace, I almost don't care because the reason that I'm making it is not to sell a lot of things. Mm. I just want to make it so it exists. Mm. But unfortunately, mm. a lot of how creative things get appreciated has a lot to do with an audience around a thing mm. to reinforce the idea that it's something that's worth consuming. And so much of that has very little to do with the quality of the thing. It has a lot to do with the drive of the people to get it heard. Yeah. What, um, what the triggers it the, hits? The, peop the people around it that's, that are able to, to um, produce it, the kind of tastes and trends happening at the time. So there's just so many arbitrary elements to what makes things appreciated. Mm. And so a lot of it is, you know, is luck. And it kind of gets back to this, this idea of... You can build something that works, that is effective at doing the thing that it wants to do, but it's a team that's too small and it doesn't have traction, like Key, for example. Mm. You know, build the thing, it works, it's, it's equivalent to other things that can, that, um, you know, are desirable in the marketplace, but it's just, we're not the right team to sell it. We're in the middle of Sydney. We're in Sydney. The hot pot is in San Fran. Hmm. You know, so, so, so much of what gets made is about the context of like a, an individual experience and so much of how it's received is a, a cultural experience, like what's hmm. happening in a, a broader culture 
that for a creator or an artist to be attached to how your stuff is received is, I think, um, I think it's deadly to the enjoyment of the creative pursuit itself. If you don't have like intrinsic joy, and again, this is my experience. So it's yeah. different when, see, because the, the work for art for me has a lot to do with expression. Like the, the work that I do is the dedication of practice and I love writing and I love the, the principles. I am not super attached to selling a lot of records or um, having a huge audience that receives it. Mm. <clears throat> but it's not my livelihood. And if it was, that stuff would be heaps more important. Yes. It's, I think, completely different for everybody. Um, and it's also circumstantial. We were talking before about what the economy is that you happen to live in. Um, uh, it's very different what hobbies and passions you can pursue now as opposed to being a surf in the Middle Ages. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've always thought that's just down to luck, really. And, you know, I'm real grateful to the extent that a thing that I happen to be really interested in um, also pays bills. That's just luck in my mind. I could be just as interested in something else that doesn't pay bills and I would be doing that thing um, because I've really never had the ability not to follow what it is that I'm interested in because that's an ability in of itself. You know, people often talk about, I think they talk about pursuing your passion as a talent and I think actually for a lot of people who end up doing the thing they care most about, it's actually really more that they couldn't resist doing it than that they took a decision that was brave to do it. Sure. Certainly, I can vouch for that proposition in my own experience. I really, I do not honestly feel like I have much of a choice than to do what I'm doing. And, you know, it's actually going totally fine at the moment, you know, and we make a good living out of it. But that's not always going to be the case. But on some level, I'm aware that even if things end up looking really dire in the future, uh, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so for the time being, it's not that stressful because things are okay and progressing. And, you know, we're all making a living, but that's not always going to be the case. And my stance towards the amount of time that I put into it is not going to change. Mm. I, I don't expect that it would if things looked worse. Yeah, because you're, as we discussed last time, no spoilers, you just want to see what's going to happen. Yeah, so I did discuss that and I will retell that story to you and I'll try and tell it better than I did last time so that you enjoy it more. <laughs> um, not that you didn't enjoy it last time, but it feels like if I'm going to repeat it, I should make it even better. And so I was talking to this lady who was just super skinny, just hard bitten looking. She's sort of in her early 40s and she was in the process of trying out to become a professional cyclist. It's a very late thing to try as a lady in your early 40s, um, but she was giving it everything. You could tell, right? She, she looked a little bit broken down. She looked sort of weathered from the, the, the constant exposure to the elements because the number of hours that they put in on the saddle is just unbelievable. And... I sort of asked her, like, at some point, this is all just incredibly hard, what you're doing. So why are you doing it? And she said, I just have to see, I want to see what is going to happen. And I felt when I heard her say that, and probably also the way she said it, that that was the closest reflection that I'd come across to what makes me work really hard at what I do kind of on some level am just beyond curious about what will happen if I do a thing that's in my head that doesn't exist in the world yet. Um, so I suppose for me that's, a, that's really the core driver, best as I can tell, aside from all the evolutionary ones and some co subconscious ones that I'm not consciously aware of. Um, that's the driver that... Uh, drives me the most day to day <laughs> on that note on that note i feel like that's ser that's serendipitous right there yes. 
Thanks very much, uh, anyone who's tuned in for How Art Works. This is the uh, first episode, Mark II, with Pat Brown. See you later. Thanks for having me. <laughs>